Okay, hello. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is a wonderful occasion, and I'm honored to be part of this program. Please, sir, uh, could you maximize your screen, please? Okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Oops, oops. Okay. Uh, Um, hmm, how come it's not, it's not cooperating? Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay, let me try this again. Oh, and now it's crashing. I'm sorry, technical troubles. No, no. Uh, one thing one thing I was told is that uh, um, whenever there's technology involved, there will be failure. Um, I'm going to leave and come back. Is that okay? Yeah. No problem. We can continue from there. We are so sorry, just we have any small technical problem and the volcanoes will come in a few seconds. After a few seconds, please, could you hold up and then we'll continue with you. Don't get our channel and uh, we are going to continue the report. Our professor had got like a small bit problem, a technical problem, so that we will. Could you please hold up and continue? Watch us in our channel because our professor is, will be on the, online within a few moments, please. We are so sorry for the delay because our professor got like a technical problem. So we are trying to connect him as possible as we can within a moment, please.
So you are highly Hi. Sorry. Happy. Hello, welcome once again. <laughs> Good to see you again. I'm well, sorry. I see the technical problem. Um, but I changed computers and uh, this should work, I hope. So Okay. Um, oh, it's still this one's still not uh, not behaving completely. Okay, well, let's see. Um, okay, there we go. This is working. Yes, everything is good, sir. You okay, know. great. Uh, I'll just get going. Okay, sorry for the problem. Something went wrong on the desktop. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be part of this program. And I'm going to talk today about the origins of economics and the right way to do economics. Um, so we're going back to Adam Smith, not quite the very beginning, but early in the development of economics. And through Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize in economics 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, and some more recent work in the field of institutional economics. Um, so we're going to talk about a different approach than has been followed in recent economic work. Um, most economics these days, as you all know, if you go back to the textbooks or you go to the American Economic Review, most economics is done in from the approach of methodological individualism. Um, and if you go to the papers, as I did years ago, the papers of John Bates Clark, one of the founders of modern American economics and, the, and uh, theories of distribution, John Bates Clark starts working out his theory of marginal productivity, thinking about Robinson Crusoe and the decisions that Robinson Crusoe stranded on a desert island all by himself. Eventually he got his man Friday, but back at, the, back at the beginning, the white man, Robinson Crusoe, was all by himself and how he would arrange his time balancing the marginal utility of consumption from going and getting another coconut with the marginal disutility of work, balancing his investment decisions in building another canoe versus the future consumption of um, coke of uh, fish that he would capture with his canoe. Um, this process is individual and it's productionless in that he's living by himself, consuming by himself on what he himself produces. Um, you go on to work done after World War II about prisoners of war exchanging chocolates and cigarettes given them by the Red Cross, all without concern for social production. It's it, the cigarettes, the chocolates, they arrive. Robinson Crusoe's coconuts are picked by himself. In this approach, there is no social interaction except you know, maybe the exchange of stuff that's produced. Robinson Crusoe is not where Adam Smith begins. Adam Smith begins with the social process of the division of labor. And this social process is threatened by the individualism championed by, by economists who talk about rational behavior. Rational behavior in modern economics is completely selfish. It's psychopathic. It operates outside of society and takes advantage of anything that is offered by people within society. Um, and we're going to talk about the institutional constraints that make a successful economy happen. A successful economy depends on social interactions. It depends on honesty and fair dealing. It depends on commitment so that incomplete contracts are honored in their fullest extent. 
It depends on taxes and regulations to protect the public and to provide for public goods. It depends on restrictions on free trade to promote macroeconomic stability. We saw what happened, we're still suffering from what happened with the absence of restrictions during the financial crisis of 2008 to 10. Um, and against those restrictions, you have free riders. You have people who will take advantage of the public infrastructure, evading taxes. We have people who will take advantage of the commitments that other people make. Um, uh, and we have people who will benefit as individuals from asymmetric information or just stealing. All of these are rational behavior when you can get away with it, but they threaten the division of labor championed by Adam Smith. So where we're going, we're going to talk about the division of labor as a source of productivity in Adam Smith and how this functions only within well organized and regulated social organizations. We're going to talk about capitalism as a particular social institution that can enhance productivity, but at the same time, capitalism depends on a particular social organization, depends on honesty, commitment, regulation, but it devours those regulations. And as Carl Polanyi talked about, capitalism risks destroying the social constraints that make capitalism function well. Okay, back to Adam Smith. The greatest improvement in the productive powers of labor and the greater part of the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which it is applied have been the effects of the division of labor. This is the very beginning of the wealth of nations. At the very beginning of the book that is seen as the beginning of economics, we have the division of labor and social organization that makes the division of labor happen. Yeah. And the pin factory, which which he took from Francois Quesnay, um, you know, the uh, the example, 10 men can make 48,000 nails in a day where one man could barely make one by himself, all by dividing work and sharing the intermediate products produced by each worker. And this is where we get improvements in dexterity, saving of time, passing from one activity to another, and invention. Adam Smith identifies the ways the division of labor increase productivity through cooperation. That is the key here. Um, now, to be sure, he left out another reason. The division of labor and my former teacher, Steve Marglin, in his very famous article, What Do Bosses Do?, talks about this. The division of labor increases productivity by allowing, by giving power to the ma management to push workers to work harder. Clarifies responsibility for particular tasks, reduces the general skill needed so workers can more easily be replaced, raising the course of disobedience. I mean, you know, um, Marx, of course, talks about this. Um, now, there's an issue here that we'll circle back to. Too much exploitation, if you push workers too hard, if you whip them too much, then that itself may undermine the legitimacy of the division of labor. It may undermine the legitimacy of the whole system. If workers feel they're being exploited too much, then they you know, may legitimately, understandably back away from the division of labor. They may stop cooperating. Um, now, there are two types of division of labor, something that Adam Smith himself kind of slurred over. Um, there's the detailed division of labor, where, oh, sorry. There's the detailed division of labor in the making of a product. Adam Smith, when he gives the reasons why the division of labor increases productivity, this is what he focuses on. Um, Karl Marx focuses on the detailed division of labor. He is Charlie Chaplin caught in the wheels of the uh, factory. Uh, 
And then there's the social division of labor, the exchange of final products. This is what Adams, when Adam Smith explains the origins of the division of labor, he talks about the social division of labor, the exchange of beavers for deer. And he talks about how dogs never engage in the division of labor. They never swap one bone for another. Um, but the division of labor has both of these elements and both of them enhance productivity. Orthodox economists, when they talk about the division of labor, um, they're usually talking about the social division of labor. Um, they're talking about how um, we exchange products for each other. Uh, Radford, when he talked about the prisoner of war camp, or France, uh, Francis Beethoven, when he talked about prisoners of war camp, he talked about um, the exchange of cigarettes for chocolates, what they talked about. Uh, but the detailed division of labor is also, um, as Smith showed, a major source of productivity gain. Um, example, I use the social division of labor is my daughter used to raise sheep. And my wife doesn't have sheep, but she has a wool skirt anyway, made from the hair of sheep. Um, you swap one thing for another. Um, now, the division of labor makes you vulnerable. You depend on others in the social division of labor. If you need she if you need wool for your skirt, you need somebody else to raise sheep. If you raise sheep, you need somebody else to give you the other things you need in exchange for your uh, sheep's wool. You also depend on others in the detailed division of labor. Um, you know, Alchian and Demsetz in their famous article in the AER in 72 uh, tried to explain the division of labor and the rise of management as a solution to the danger that people, others will slack off or shirk. I hate the word shirk, but it's in the literature. Um, others will, will shirk the work that they're supposed to do, work that you depend on. Um, now, as I said, productivity in Smith is about the detailed division of labor in, in production. All the examples he gives of productivity enhancements are from there. Um, his explanation of the origins is there. Um, now, when Smith explains the extent of the division of labor, the division of labor being the source of productivity growth and our wealth. So we want to understand the extent of the division of labor. Smith explains it entirely in terms of social division of labor and the extension of the market. Um, you will specialize to the extent that there can be a lot of other people or other businesses producing specialized products that you need. If you're all by yourself, you have to produce everything all by yourself. If there are two other people around, then the three of you can each take one third of the products that need to be produced and specialize in those. As you get a larger market, you can specialize more intently. So you have a world market, you can specialize in making one teeny tiny component of an airplane or something. Now, um, this right away embeds the division of labor and social facts. Economists these days, the methodological individuals, might focus on the standard triumvirate, a technology, factor endowments, um, and preferences. So they'll, they may focus on transportation technology, factor endowments, access to water, population size, maybe preferences for novelties. There are people who have explained the rise of capitalism in Europe by the Crusades that increased preferences for, uh, by West Europeans for Eastern products. You know, you could say that. Uh, I don't, but other people do. Um, but Smith himself, he didn't stay, stop there. He talked about trade restrictions, social policy, stable currencies and financial systems, common systems of weights and measures or language. <laughs> Look at the huge advantage in the, division, in the world division of labor that Americans and Brits have from our command of the, uh, the world language. 
uh, security of property. You know, uh, if you don't have laws and judicial systems that protect people's property, then you'll limit the division of labor. And beyond that, security of property is not just about um, laws and judicial systems and police. It's a, more than that, it's about honesty. Where does this come from? Where do we get people with respect for um, other people's property and a willingness to honor contracts in all their dimensions? We get them from mothers, fathers. Um, a Smithian production function has to include all of these social institutions, all the social institutions that promote the division of labor, promote the social division of labor, and also promote the detailed division of labor so that you don't have to rely on judges. You don't have to rely on police to come into your workplace and tell your workers what to do, or police to come into your workplace and tell your boss what to do. All these things lower transactions costs. Um, all of these things provide for the public goods that we need, protection of the commons, shared knowledge, physical infrastructure. You know, we need people who will honestly pay their taxes. Yeah. Um, the detailed division of labor relies on these social institutions, also relies on commitment investment in plant and worker training, you're only gonna do that if you are confident about the future. You know, as Keynes talked about, you know, people think of Keynes, some people think of Keynes in terms of methodological individualism, but his, his understanding of animal spirits and investment relied on a sense that there will be a public sector providing for stability so that people can invest confidently that there will be demand for the products of their expanded production facilities. Um, relies on cooperation, um, relies on workers' belief that their employer will honor their long-term contracts. And it relies on employers' belief that their workers will remain on the job will, after receiving training, will continue to work. Um, now, Coase, for, Ronald Coase, formalized this. Um, I mean, Coase is the nature of the firm, maybe the only um, article that I explicitly link to in my PowerPoint here. Um, Coase, of course, is one of the giants of 20th century economics, um, shows the power of a small number of articles. He wrote two articles that had impact. Um, does anybody know anything else he ever wrote? I mean, he did write other things, but these are the two. Won the Nobel Prize and totally deserved it. Um, you know, the nature of the firm and social course. Uh, but here we're only going to talk about the nature of the firm. Firms replace the division of labor with command. Um, so you get the detailed division of labor within the firm operating often through command. Not always. I mean, many American um, type, the typewriter firms, machinery firms, gun firms through into the 20th century operated on a subcontracting basis. Um, you know, but others operated explicitly through command. Um, and you extend the reach of your command to make up for the cost of using the market. Um, the detailed division of labor operates th to the extent that transactions costs are not too high. You get the operation of the detailed division of labor within the firm um, to the extent that you can work with people. Where transactions costs get high, you don't use the market. You know, um, so you could imagine in Kosian terms, high transactions costs um, and, um, and people reject hierarchy 
you're not going to have much trade. You'll get large firms with lots of command. Um, high transactions costs where people uh, don't, ex where, sorry, sorry, high transactions, co low transactions costs where people accept hierarchy, you'll get lots and lots of cooperation and you'll get the detailed division of labor operating. And that's what we want. By embedding economic activity within social institutions, Coase and Smith bring history and power into our analysis of markets. For Smith, institutions matter because they structure exchange and social division of labor. For Coase, institutions matter for both the social and the detailed division of labor because they substitute command for markets. But both, whether command or markets, you rely on cooperation and you rely on the willingness of people to cooperate. This is what Wolfgang Streeck, the German sociologist calls beneficial constraints. Beneficial constraints are those social facts, to go to Durkheim, social facts that constrain behavior in ways that facilitate the detail and social division of labor. Um, now, today, when you're talking about the division of labor, it operates through generally capitalist marketplaces. Most of the world and most of our um, economic cooperation outside families is through capitalist markets. Um, now, the capitalist market, to use Marxian um, terminology here, begins with money, capitalist higher labor power with their money. They use their command over labor through the detailed division of labor to um, get the workers to produce commodities. And then um, they sell the commodities, they hope, for more money than they started with. If they don't sell the commodities for more money than they started with, if they don't make a profit, then they're not going to remain capitalist for very long. So we can generally assume that M prime here is going to be greater than M they end up with more money. What do they do with that more money? Of course, they use it to hire more labor. Or sorry, more labor power. So they expand the process, producing even more commodities and selling them for even more money. Um, capitalists are always seeking to expand greater scope for their commodity markets. They're always looking for more labor. They're always looking to sell more commodities. They shift production in society towards commodities, more social division of labor. They hire people who used to be independent farmers and they put them to work uh, producing commodities. Um, within fir Here's the problem for capitalists, of course. Well, one problem. One problem is within firms, they need to get the workers to work hard. Now, to some extent, capitalism rests on workers having a weak fallback position. They have to undermine. A successful capitalist economy is one that has undermined independent production. Again, the social institutions are essential. Um, they're going to be redistributing income towards capitalists away from workers so they're going to have issues of selling their products. They're going to have issues of getting workers to cooperate in the intensification of labor effort. Capitalist, re, capitalism relies on the social institution of proletarianized labor, workers who don't have alternatives, and workers and consumers in general who are who need to buy things. Now, from here, from Marx, and influenced by Marx, there was the rise of the study of capital labor relations. The German historical school is not usually seen as Marxist, of course, but many of them read Marx, and they sometimes engage in direct debates with Marxists. John Maurice Clark is one of the most interesting because he's a son of John Bates Clark. And John Maurice Clark, um, you know, was 
arguably the most prominent American economist of the mid 20th century. And while he never explicitly, to my knowledge, criticized his father, um, he did, you know, he approached economics in a very different way. His father signed his dissertation, which was on the rise of the modern corporation and the detailed division of labor. Of course, John Bates Clark himself, while he worked within methodological individualism, he studied in Germany with um, some of the early uh, people in the German historical school. Um, uh, but Maurice Clark's uh, work was to study how the modern corporation and the extended social and detailed division of labor within it raised efficiency and created new economic patterns. Burley and Means in the rise of the modern corporation, um, you know, talked about the decline of market competition, the substitution of social division of labor, of that is substitution of detailed division of labor and command for the social division of labor. Doug North, coming back to him, worked on the rise of the uh, transaction sector. Um, Francis Fukuyama, uh, better known for his work on the end of history, um, has a fascinating book on trust, that's the title, um, on the need for trust or honesty um, across incomplete contracts so that we don't steal from each other. And without that, the social division of labor and the detailed division of labor can't happen. North and Thomas, the rise of the West, Asimoglu and Robinson, who all come back to why nations fail. This is all about transactions costs. Now, from for these guys, North and Thomas, Asimoglu and Robinson, um, Fukuyama, the general idea is that Transactions costs depend on honesty and respect for property rights. And once you get property rights, you'll get economic growth. Once you protect the capitalist property, you'll get economic growth um, spontaneously. Uh, Smith himself, in focusing on the social division of labor and the detailed division of labor, also um, argues for the essential role of property rights. Um, and honesty in promoting the social division of labor, which will lead to growth. I call this a benign approach. Private property division of labor will spontaneously lead to efficiency because everyone benefits. Um, when George Stigler told his story about there are no $20 bills sitting around on the street, um, you know the story. Uh, he's working with a graduate student. The graduate student <clears throat> says, oh, professor, excuse me, I have to pick this up. There's a $20 bill over there. And Stigler said to her, oh, no, if it were real, somebody else would have gotten it. Don't bother. Yeah. Economic growth happens spontaneously because bad institutions will be replaced by good institutions. So we'll protect property rights. Um because everybody benefits. But it's not always that way. Sometimes people can benefit by taking advantage of other people's honesty. Take electronic medical records. Electronic medical records um, have been pushed for over a decade in the United States. Billions and billions of dollars of federal money has gone to Um, subsidizing the development and the sharing of electronic medical records. Um, electronic medical records allow doctor, different doctors working or different providers working uh, uh, with a single patient to share information. Um, they allow a nurse to uh, immediately call up a uh, patient's records and see if they're allergic to anything that they, you know, you know, in injecting them. You know, there's definitely real advantages of electronic medical records. Um, but they also allow scamming or I, I don't know a better word for it. Gr grifting is a word used for this. Um, and this, there's an article just two days ago in the New York Times about cyber attacks launched by Russian cyber criminals um, who have 
penetrated the electronic medical record systems, installed viruses, malware in these systems, and then um, offered to remove the malware that has closed down electronic medical record systems in hospitals only in exchange for money. Um, hospitals have been pretty quiet about this. The Times says it's because they don't want to interfere with the FBI investigation. It's also because they're pretty embarrassed that their systems were penetrated like this. And patients have had delays in care, inappropriate care, uh, because their electronic medical record systems were defective. Um, $60 million, $61 million has been paid in ransom over less than two years. And the system, everything's gotten worse because the Trump administration has fired many of the people involved in cybersecurity who had been working at stopping these. Is that an accident that the grifting, corrupt Trump administration, which works with, which, which is perhaps completely controlled by Vladimir Putin, has helped the uh, Russian hackers, I let you draw your own conclusions. But the point the, for us isn't just about the corruption of the Trump administration, but this is a good way to make money. These cyber criminals have made $61 million by damaging something that should be a productive social, uh, productive aid to the social division of labor. If you can't work with the electronic medical record system, then you just have to do it all yourself. You have to provide all the care to the patient by yourself. You can't have the detailed division of labor and the social division of labor um, in the face of this type of corruption. Um, this is just generally a problem. Greater economic inequality, where there's more money to steal, is associated with more stealing which makes it harder to do the social division of labor. Crime increases in American cities. Each one of these dots rec um, represents an American city with the crime rate uh, in the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is um, the level of inequality. So among the most unequal cities in America, you have Miami Beach with a very high crime rate. Salt Lake City, which surprises me, um, has a high crime rate. Um, Newton, Massachusetts has a lower crime rate, even though it has almost the same inequality as Salt Lake City and greater than Springfield, Missouri. Um, I don't want to say that New Englanders, where I live, are morally superior, raise their children better. Um, so that you get less crime given any level of inequality. But yeah, New England has much lower crime rate. We have much, we're doing much better with COVID despite the federal government, despite the Trump administration. Um, we are more responsible people. We have better schools. We invest more in our children. Um, so given any level of inequality, and we actually have fairly high levels of inequality in New England, um, certainly in Massachusetts, where we have some very, very rich people um, and a lot of very poor people. Um, but still, we're more honest. We're better people. <laughs> it shows up in these studies that are done where they drop a wallet on the street and they wait around to see who picks it up and whether they you know, get in touch with the person who supposedly owns the wallet and return the money. Um, New England is more honest. Um, you know, they do these international studies. I'm not going to talk about which countries are less honest, but the point is that honesty can mitigate the effects of inequality, but it can't prevent it. Inequality undermines honesty. Capitalism which rests, depends on honesty because capitalist markets depend on, on honesty. The division of labor within capitalism depends on honesty, but capitalism itself undermines honesty. Um, here are the measures of inequality. This is different countries in the world. More inequality, less confidence in local police. More inequality, less willingness, or you know, less feeling of safety. Um, 
you know, more money's been stolen in places with more inequality. More people have been assaulted. Those effects are weaker, but still, you know, they're there. Um, inequality and crime force businesses and individuals to spend more on security. Yeah. So you have more spending on, on security services. In the United States, just the last, just the 20 years from 79, 1979 to 2000, there was a big uptick in inequality and also in spending. So this holds not only cross-sectionally, but longitudinally. I, spending on security is, is a way to protect this division of labor, but it under, it's expensive and another response to rising crime is to just cut back on the division of labor, bring more stuff in house or just not work with other people. And to the extent that you don't work with other people, you get slower economic growth. You know, long-term average inequality is associated with lower, lower rates of economic growth. Less inequality, more economic growth. Um, this holds for, well, these are um, high, you know, rich countries, the OECD. Here are poorer countries, and the same effect holds. More inequality, slower rates of economic growth. You want less inequality if you want faster growth because Inequality undermines honesty and integrity in business dealings that reduce your use of the uh, division of labor. The IMF finds this. I mean, you know, this work from the IMF um, by uh, Ostry, um, um, and well, in this paper, he worked with other people, but Ostry is the one that I associate with this at the IMF. You don't expect the IMF to be arguing for redistribution, but they've been doing that for the last 10 years, arguing that taking from the rich and giving to the poor, reducing inequality is associated with faster economic growth. Um, and the mechanism is through promoting the social and detailed division of labor. Inequality, greater inequality, slower growth. Um, now, Asimoglu and Robinson would focus on property rights here. They'd say, well, more crime, property rights are less secure. And, you know, I accept that. Doug North would, would go there too. Um, Asimoglu and Robinson, why nations fail? You know, that's the whole, the whole story. Uh, but there's a deeper story here. And I think one that comes from Smith and Coase um, also from Alexis de Tocqueville and Emil Durkheim in his classic book on inequality. Um, <clears throat> what's really going on here is behind honesty is the social legitimacy of property rights and the distribution. Where people accept the legitimacy of the system of distribution where they accept the legitimacy of property rights, um, they will cooperate. They'll cooperate in the detailed division of labor. They'll cooperate by not stealing from each other. Um, around where I live, Amherst, Massachusetts, there are many farmers who will leave their extra vegetables out on a stand with a box, with a slit on the box, and you can put your money in. Now, presumably, <clears throat> they only do this because they're confident. There's nobody guarding it. In fact, you could walk away with the box. Sometimes it's not even, you know, it's not even held down by anything. You could take all their money and all their vegetables, but people don't. If they did, the farmers wouldn't be doing this. So people don't because they accept the legitimacy of the farmer's work. And they accept that the farmer is entitled to money for the vegetables. Just like I'm entitled for the vegetables if I leave the money there. Yeah. What creates the sense of social legitimacy? For de Tocqueville and Durkheim, it's a fair distribution of income, not equal necessarily, but fair. You know, 
Um, somebody may be entitled to more money. That farmer may be entitled to more money because he worked hard and he produced the vegetables. Um, but I'm entitled to eat. And a democracy promotes these. De Tocqueville, in his classic Democracy in America, argued how participation, um, equal rights, promotes social legitimacy leading to honest dealing. Honest dealing is not just from judges and police protecting property rights. It's from the rich accepting that the poor and that working people also have contributed to production and accepting that they owe to the work, their workers just like their workers owe to them. Gig labor, rising inequality, exploitation, all undermine the sense of legitimacy on which the social division of labor and economic growth rests. Left alone, capitalists will destroy the very institutions that are necessary for a well-functioning, prosperous capitalist economy. This is the question that Polanyi raised. Um, in the great transformation. Rational economic behavior, everything that economists praise when they talk about meth, you know, the indiv rational individual, the individual who just goes out for herself. Sharp dealing, where you take advantage of other people's lack of knowledge. Um, a, you have asymmetric information and you exploit it. All this undermines um, the expansion, the, the social division of labor and the detailed division of labor by raising transactions. Because if I think that you are going to be taking advantage of me in our dealing, then I'm not going to deal with you. George Akaloff, in his classic article on lemons, showed this. You know, if you oppose public spending, capitalists oppose public spending all over the world, then you're undermining the infrastructure on which your system rests. Cuts, uh, tax cuts in the United States have undermined our ability to maintain the very roads. My wife drives along and complains to me that, oh God, the United States is becoming a third world country. Well, they are third world countries with better roads than we have some in parts of the United States now. FedEx, the delivery company, has to replace their tires 20% more frequently than 20 years, than in 2000, because of declining roads, because capitalists have, have used their political power to cut public spending. Rising inequality include, encourages individuals to search for self-advancement, like those Russian hackers. The money's out there, I'm gonna take it, and undermining the use of electronic medical records. The relentless expansion of commodity markets as capitalists produce more and more and more is undermining the very capacity of the planet to support human life. To go back to this earlier slide, this is a repeat. Honesty is undermined by individuals who benefit from asymmetric information or just by theft. Commitment. If employers or employees can benefit by not honoring their promises, people won't invest. If employers feel that workers are going to just leave once they're trained, employers won't train them. If employees feel that work, that capitalists won't honor their pension obligations or won't respect systems of seniority promotion, then workers won't work so hard. Taxes, free riders who don't want to contribute by who, who put their money in the Cayman Islands or in Ireland undermine the general welfare by reducing our ability to provide for public services. Those who cheat on financial regulations undermine the integrity of the financial markets and um, restrictions on free trade may be needed to promote economic growth by favoring industries that need help free riders will profit from these. Restrictions on financial trading may be needed to protect the 
uh, financial markets. Free riders take advantage of, uh, go around those, undermining the financial markets, creating economic crises. Um, who's going to protect the capitalists from themselves? <laughs> I put up Franklin Roosevelt here. Uh, you know, the standard line about Franklin Roosevelt, president of the United States from 1933 to 1945, is that while he was called a socialist by his opponents, he was anything but that. He saved capitalism in America and kind of throughout the world, for better or for worse. Roosevelt saved capitalism at against the opposition of virtually every large capitalist because he restricted their individual search for profit. And it's those restrictions on individual search for profit, the protection of market institution of social institutions that restrain individual behavior. These beneficial constraints are what allows the division of labor and allows a prosperous economy. So that's, that's where you go if you want to do better economics. You go from Adam Smith to, um, to uh, the German historical school, to Karl Marx, to Doug North, and you end with an understanding that capitalism, a successful capitalist economy, depends on restraining the activities of capitalists. You know, this is, you know, you could say this is the lesson of Polanyi, that um, the dialectical process of individual search for profit and the social division of labor has to be balanced. You know, if one side or the other go, gets the upper hand, then um, you'll lose the individual incentive to be productive and to innovate, or you'll lose the individual capacity to be productive and to innovate by undermining the division of labor. We need to embed capitalism in beneficial constraints. Um, so thank you very much. This is I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, and I look forward to uh, the rest of the conference. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you very much. This is that for the presentation, and I think like uh, so we don't have any questions for right now. Mm -hmm. So I will leave the speech to Mrs. Sema, Dr. Sema. Maybe she can say something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I said, like, Sema, maybe she wants to say something. Oh, thank you very much. Ah, for okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I see, hey, you know, I see the next one coming up. Yeah. Yes. yes. How are you doing, Louis Philippe? Well, uh, well uh, I would like to welcome again uh, Mr. Philippe Louis uh, Rochon. Mm -hmm. Will uh, will be the, the upcoming uh, presenter for our in our our keynote. Mm -hmm. So hi, Mr. Ruiz. Hello. How are you? How are you doing, Gerald? We are doing well. We are doing well. I'm doing well. My country may be on a path to rejoining <laughs> the civilized world. <laughs> so we're very happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're talking about the possibility that Trump will gain victory is that what you're talking about <laughs> uh, not exactly <laughs> what, what a dark hour that's been a nightmare absolute nightmare you know um, um i've been on a daily basis i kept telling myself surely this can't get worse on a daily basis, you know what I'm talking about. On yes. a daily basis, yes. this can't get worse. And it and kept it's getting crazy. worse. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Oh, really? You know, it exposed the worst. You know, uh, Leonard Cohn died like three days after Trump was elected. 
and my dog died the next day. Oh, yeah. I swear, my dog looked at me and said, you humans have totally screwed up <laughs> and I can't make it without Leonard Cohn around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but Cohn in one song, you know, has the lyric, um, America, the best and the worst. And mm. we sh we've sure shown the world our worst. Yeah, yeah. But I am hope, you know, Biden is a good, decent man. And, you know, I hope that we'll be able to uh, come back. If not, the world, I, I don't mean to be egocentric about it, but the world needs the United States to lead in a constructive way on, on climate change, mm -hmm. um, global development. You know, it's, these things are not going to happen. The Europeans can't do it. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's, let's hope for the best. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Where, but, where are you now? Are you... Amherst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I um <clears throat> I miscalculated the time of my talk. I thought it was at six. You know, how many economists does it take to calculate a time zone difference? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I had a problem. How many economists computers does it take to make a decent internet connection? Oh, really? I had to switch from my desktop yeah. to my laptop yeah. in the yeah. yeah. So yeah, but I did check the time like three times on three different. Uh, you know, on no, Bing, no, on but Google. so did I. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Yes, yes, yeah. So if I was writing a paper on exchange rates, it would be clearly rejected. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, you never know with the referee process. They uh, reject a lot of good papers and accept bad ones. Yeah. Oh, yeah, when for it, sure. When it comes sure. to the economic, not your journal, of course. But I know, but, you know, it, yeah, it happens all the time, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I will let you proceed. It is good thank seeing you. you. And thank you. Getting a you paper so on our dear friend Basil. I, I will. I will. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Au revoir. And, I, au revoir. I'll be Bye-bye, Gerald. And, and again, Siva and Faisal, thank you so much. This is a great you, opportunity. Israeli bienvenue, Monsieur Philippe Rochon. Au revoir. Au revoir. Okay. Bon arrivée. Uh, you are here. welcome once again, uh, uh, Professor Philippe. Uh, Miss Philippe uh, Rochon. And then uh, we have to, after within a one, one or two minutes we are, we are we are within one minute we are going to start with you and you are held welcome the economic of Basel uh, more this is the topic of our professor who will be start with us so sir you have the speech sir I can start now. Yes, you are online now and then you have the speech. No problem. Perfect. Well, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to um, all, uh, all those who are listening and all those who will be watching the video on YouTube. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, wonderful to be, uh, to be a part of this conference. And uh, today's talk uh, is very dear to me. It's based on a paper that's out now uh, in uh, Egypt, the European Journal of Economics and Economic Policy. And it's a paper that um, will uh, discuss the economics of a good friend of mine, good friend of yours as well, uh, Basil Moore. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and uh, there you go. And I have to try to make this um, there you go. What a way to uh, I'm not exactly sure how to make this right here. Yep. Nope. 
Apologies, I don't seem to be able to. Slideshow, uh, sir. I'm just trying to make it uh, big. In the slideshow. Ah, uh, there you go. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. You're okay. Welcome. Um. So today's talk is uh, so my name for those who don't know me, Louis Fleprochon. I am a full professor of economics at Laurentian University in Canada. Uh, I am the current co-editor of the Review of Political Economy the founding editor of the Review of Keynesian Economics and the lead editor of a book series, a new book series by Elgar. Uh, this is a 10 book series on central banking and monetary policy. Um, so um, the talk today is on uh, Basel. And um, if, uh, Caldor is to be considered the father of endogenous money. Basel could be considered certainly its uncle, so to speak, um, certainly revived uh, endogenous money very forcefully in the late seventies and early eighties. And Basel certainly is known as the father of the horizontalist view. Um, of course, endogenous money um, predates Basel uh, in the, I'm not talking here about the debates between the banking school and currency school going back a few centuries, but even in the more recent uh, revival uh, contemporary setting, we have to think about John Robinson, whose accumulation of capital I consider to be sort of the first, uh, uh, the first book on post Keynesian economics and of course, there are others. Uh, Jacques Le Bourgeois, 1962, who was a French uh, banker, and others. But uh, and and Caldor, of course, in the 70s. But um, Basel really needs to be credited with having revived the concept of endogenous money and having made it really sort of the cornerstone of post Keynesian economics. I first met Basel. I think it was 1984 at a conference at the University of Ottawa where I was an undergraduate. I was taking classes with Marc Lavoie, Mario Sicareccia, and Alain Parguez at the time. And um, they had organized a rather big post Keynesian conference. And I first met Basil there. And I um, was familiar mostly at the time with his 1979 uh, paper in uh, Eichner's book and a guide to post Keynesian economics. And, uh, and so I knew a bit about him and I certainly was very uh, interested in meeting him and having studied economics, economics with Lavoie and Sicareccia and endogenous money was very much part of um, what we were learning. So I remember going for a very long walks, two walks maybe with Basil and I was maybe 20 at the time and he encouraged me very much uh, to continue studying uh, post Keynesian economics. And in my 1999 book, um, I wrote uh, Basil Moore has of course played a pivotal role as he did. Since early on, I found his work both stimulating and rich and I acknowledge his apparent intellectual influence on my work and this is you know, could have been written by a number of young scholars at the time and today as well. Um, Basil influenced quite a number of people. And I visited Basil, I think I was probably the last of the post Keynesians to have seen him. Um, I visited him uh, in his uh, wonderful house in Stolenbosch, South Africa, just a few months before he passed or several months before he passed. And I have a few pictures there that I took. And of course, on the left is, is Basil and uh, his wonderful wife, Sibs. And uh, on the right, uh, beautiful property um, called Moore's End. And uh, I wrote the obituary for Basil for the Royal Society, Economic Society. And um, you should check it out. Uh, wonderful memories of Basil that I wrote in there. And the second picture at the bottom, well, that was just my view, the view from my bedroom where I was staying on the property. Um, just absolutely beautiful. 
And I remember that evening very well. And, um, uh, well, you know, I keep very fond memories of Basil and Sibs, um, of course. So like I said, today's presentation is based on my paper uh, in Egypt. And uh, this was a special issue in honor of Basil that was edited by Mark Setterfield. And Mark has a wonderful introduction and there are um, the other papers in there are, are, are from Sheila Dow and Giuseppe Fontana, John Smith and Malcolm Sawyer and uh, Peter Doherty. And it's a nice little tribute to Basil. I encourage you all to, uh, to, um, to pick it up. Of course, Mark Setterfield also edited a wonderful uh, Feschrift in honor of Basil in which I have a, a chapter and uh, you should consider that uh, reading that as well. Now, Basil, of course, is, is famous for his book, Horizontalists and Verticalists, and um, which generated quite the controversy within post-Keynesian economics. As you all know, it led to a ferocious debate uh, between the horizontalists and what was called the structuralists. And, you know, to be fair, the, the debate started a little bit before. Basil had, been, um, had written a few papers in the JPKE on endogenous money, and uh, there was a considerable debate. And these debates uh, led to, you know, the book. I guess the book is in a way uh, a result of those early debates. And the book itself was a catalyst for uh, considerably more debates. Um, and um, I won't deal with that. I won't deal with what Basil said in the book or those debates. I've written, um, extensively on those uh, debates. And in a way, I think uh, they should be considered over. I think that uh, we are all horizontalists now. I mean, there's cannot be any doubt in my mind that uh, uh, we're not horizontalists. And, um, and this is a quote uh, by Ulrich, who um, I published in 2003. And so in the review of Keynesian economics, I published three papers, I think three papers in honor of Basil. Um, John King and James Cullum wrote a, pay, a wonderful paper, um, as did uh, Ulrich Beinsell. And um, um, Ulrich, uh, who's at the ECB, of course, and who concludes, we have, we have all become horizontalists in the last 25 years. That symposium was in honor of the 25th anniversary of the publication of Basil's book. And when Ulrich says we, of course he means central bankers. And I think this is a, a, an important conclusion. Now, if I won't be dealing with the, uh, the, the debates or Basil's views in 1988, which I said are very well known, what I do wanna know, do deal with is, um, the 20 or so years that predates, um, or 30 years actually, I miscalculated, um, the 30 years that predates uh, the publication of Basil's book uh, from 1958 to 1979. And 79 is a very important date because that's when I think that Basil finally understood what endogenous money was all about. 79 refers to his paper in uh, Challenge Magazine, which was reprinted in Eichner's book, uh, Guide to Post Gains in Economics. And also Basil has a paper in the JPKE in 1979 as well. So I think that by then he grasped the essence of endogenous money. And my argument is that was not always the case. Um, Basil comes from, his early roots are um, rooted in some sort of new Keynesian or Tobin Keynesian uh, roots. And uh, it wasn't very clear to me uh, that uh, he, I think actually, actually it was clear to me that he didn't quite understand endogenous money. So I'm gonna go over uh, Basil's own long struggle of escape. One that I don't think he never really fully escaped, even in his 1988 book, there are some problem passages, but I'm not going to deal with them. Um, I've dealt with them elsewhere. Um, so 
first, I do want to say what is endogenous money. Um, I don't want, I, you know, I could give a slide, a show, uh, a presentation on what is endogenous money, uh, but I'm going to follow the definition from my book. And also um, of note is my paper with uh, Rossi in Roque on the evolutionary and revolutionary views of endogenous money. Um, clearly, Basil to this day, um, I would put in the evolutionary category of, uh, of endogenous money, very much in the uh, Chickian sense of the evolution of banks um, and of central banks. And this is clear in the 30 years leading up to the book. Now, um, in my book, I, I talk about five or six um, characteristics of endogenous money, but two which are particularly important here is the idea that banks are never constrained in their lending activities, except for the demand um, credit worthy um, customers. So as long as they are credit worthy, banks will lend to them and certainly um, banks are not constrained by their deposits or their reserves. So it's the assets that determine the liabilities of the bank's balance sheet. And this is, I think, important uh, to understand Basel's evolution. Um, and this is, you know, like I said, he came around to this view uh, later on. I want to talk about three specific uh, phases in Basel's work. The first is the 1958 to 1970, which I call, you know, the Neo Keynesian you know, or the mainstream of the Tobin phase of his work. Then the 1970 to 1977, which began with um, his sabbatical at Cambridge University. And uh, which I call, to use Basil's own words, his years of awakening. And then the period 1979 to 1988, uh, which are uh, the horizontalist years, 1979, marks um, uh, another sabbatical he took at the Bank of England, where he became friends with Charles Goodart, and that influence as well. And this is when Basil started. Uh, uh, get uh, understanding clearly um, <clears throat> endogenous money. But there is nevertheless, despite these three phases, um, a consistent a consistency through Basil's three phases, which was his opposition to the quantitative uh, quantity theory of money, as he explains in an interview to John King in a wonderful, wonderful interview. Uh, this is a book by John where he interviews a bunch of economists. I really recommend this book. But Basil says, you know, he was always uncomfortable with Friedman. Uh, he was always critical of Friedman and that Friedman was the enemy. And, um, and so this is consistency. And you can see, you can clearly see this uh, even in his very early views um, on money. So, um, the first phase, uh, this is following his uh, uh, PhD. Um, Basil was always interested in banks. Banks always played a very important role. They were always at the center of his analysis. Um, you know, bank lending, lending was done because there were credit worthy customers and um, he uh, says here, he says, uh, the role of banks, the proper role of banks is to accommodate legitimate non-speculative business demand for short-term credit. And so he was certainly aware of sort of this credit-led principle that uh, he developed much later on. And, uh, but in that, you know, in that early period, he contrasts that view with what he calls uh, the portfolio behavior um, of banks. And it's um, sort of this portfolio behavior 
that um, dominates. I mean, he says that these are not mutually exclusive. Um, but here he says, as long as the legitimate demand for loans is not greater than the available supply of loans by banks. So here, clearly, there's a supply constraint to the lending activities of, uh, of banks. And in my book in 1999, I call this the credit-led but supply-determined um, banking model. And... Um, you know, so in other words, as long as the demand for credit doesn't um, is not greater than the available supply, banks can accommodate. But clearly, the the supply of these loans are is limited, and this is perfectly consistent with Tobin's new view. Um, and uh, there are other instances as well. Um, cer certainly his main publication in this period is an introductory book uh, from 1968 where he sees banks of financial intermedi intermediaries. Um, he talks about banks lending out the deposits uh, of their customers. So very fairly conventional um, stuff. Um, in the Roke paper by... Cullum and King, uh, they clearly say, and, and I agree, there's no hint of endogenous money uh, in his book on the theory of finance, um, which was influenced by Metzer and Patinkin and James Tobin, you see. So um, so this was uh, sort of Basil's um, early beginnings, a very conventional beginning. But you, you know, you see elements that will come back uh, later on in his career, specifically the demand determined uh, view, the credit worthiness, all of that is there. The only thing that's, that, that is different is uh, this view of a supply constraint. That starts to change. 1970, Basil uh, is a visiting scholar, senior visitor at the University of Cambridge. And uh, he describes this period as the sun coming out and with reason. Um, now, Basil claims that that's when he first publicly tied his flag to the endogenous money poll. I don't think that's correct. I think he's starting to open the door, but he's not quite there yet. But nevertheless, this was a, a very um, a formative period uh, but let's get one thing straight. Basil didn't go to Cambridge to study the Cambridge Economist or the Cambridge View or the Caldor, the Robinson. Not at all. Um, Caldor, sorry, uh, uh, Basil, uh, and this comes from his uh, current wife, uh, uh, Sibs. Uh, he just loved England. And he had a friend there Um who uh, I guess uh, was on sabbatical and he had a free office. And so Basil decided why not, went to Cambridge. Um, and also I think to be closer to his first wife who was in Germany at the time. So he went there for purely personal reasons, nothing very academic. But once at Cambridge, he was at Cambridge. So he immersed himself in Keynes, uh, the general theory, the treaties of money. And these were certainly formative, a uh, formative period. But history has a way of playing dirty tricks on you because um, when he was uh, at Cambridge, um, his office was in between the office of Joan Robinson and Richard Kahn. And at the time, uh, Paul Davidson was in uh, Kahn's office and Paul was in Cambridge to write um, Money in the Real World. So Basil ended up by sheer coincidence um, in between Joan and Paul. And like I say here, did Basil become a post-Keynesian by sheer historical accident? Um, and, but nevertheless, uh, Paul, uh, Paul and Basil developed a very strong friendship. He had numerous conversations 
uh, with Robinson, who would, you know, leave Basil and Paul, same thing. She would leave notes on what she had read or ideas that had popped up in her head. And also, Basil didn't have a lot of interaction with Caldor, but did sit in some of his lectures. And 1970s, when Caldor published his paper on endogenous money, I think in the Lloyd's Bank Review. So there was certainly a lot of, a lot of discussion. And as you can imagine, uh, with Paul um, on money, and John Robinson, as I said, wrote the first sort of authoritative uh, uh, paper on money, or I should say book, uh, The Accumulation of Capital contains a lot of uh, stuff on, on, on um, endogenous money, on the, the monetary circuit, probably as a result of having read uh, Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, but um, but these, the, the, all these had a tremendous impact on Basel. And you see a lot of references uh, to this. Um, and, 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 and it's not a great leap of faith. Like I said, in the previous pe uh, uh, period, he saw banks as important. He was halfway there. So having met Joan and Paul and, and Caldor, um, I'm not surprised that the, these events just pushed him over the, the edge, so, so to speak. And here's a couple of quotes uh, by Basil. In an interview he gave to Egypt in 2010, the reason why I became a post Keynesian was that I became a good friend with Paul Davidson. Um, and I, I believe that. Uh, I believe our numerous discussions in Cambridge, plus lectures by Caldor and Robinson that we attended finally converted Basil to a more, oh yeah, so this is a quote from Davidson. Uh, and I agree with this, this is in an email he sent me to a more post Keynesian approach and led him to the concept of endogenous money. I agree. Um, in his book, he writes in the introduction, my greatest intellectual debt is to Paul Davidson. Um, and uh, now I, he did have a very strong friendship with Paul, but I'm not sure if, if Paul's views led him to the endogenous uh, theory. Uh, Paul at the time in Money in the Real World, and John King um, agrees with this position. Um, <clears throat> Paul's view on endogenous money has always been sort of a very tricky one. It's about a shifting LM curve. Uh, so not exactly the horizontal curve, but nevertheless, I think there was a lot of, of, of um, seeds that were planted in Basil's mind at the time. Um, now, he published a paper in the Economic Journal in 1972. And this was a paper that was uh, in the same issue as a paper by Paul Davidson, coincidence. But um, nevertheless, it was probably written either at Cambridge or shortly after, submitted in very early 71 and published in 72. And so I think it's important, and I think of that, that paper in which he quotes Caldor and, and Cramp, I think that, um, um, excuse me, uh, I'm about to sneeze. Yeah, maybe not, <coughs> maybe, okay, uh, excuse me. So he, he, he quotes Caldor and Cramp and, uh, you know, um, the paper is very interesting because he talks about, um, interest rates and as a control variable and there's all there's already a there's all there's a section there called the endogenous money supply and in the column and king uh, paper in roke i'm not exactly why they they conclude that there's no endogenous money in this paper because there is um there's clearly endogenous money i think that uh this is not surprising. I would have been surprised if there had not been after he had spent a year at Cambridge with uh, with our protagonists, but there, there was. And, but this view of endogenous money, I think he very much goes back to his early period in which, you know, the, he is aware of accommodation. Here he's 
a lot more aware of it. And he says endogenous money, certainly a, a, a possibility, but he sees that as a choice of central banks. It's a policy choice. Central banks must allow money to be endogenous. And here you see very much um, sort of the evolutionary view uh, that I talked about in my paper with, uh, with Sergio Rossi. Um, Basel sees endogenous money as a policy choice of central banks. He says, whether the money stock or interest rates are the optimum control of instrument depends on the central bank. The degree to which the money supply is endogenous. Um, is a policy, you know, rule. Uh, so, so, you know, this is not exactly endogenous money, um, but nevertheless, um, he's, he, he's almost there. Now, uh, let's be clear. Moore does not see endogenous money as do the secretists. For us, money's endogenous because it's very nature to debt. Um, this is sort of very much in the same uh, vein as the MMT. I think uh, one of the best chapters on this was written by Randy in his, uh, what was it, 1991 book, I think chapter one, very good relationship with debt. And so this is what secretists are about. Basel view of endogenous money is not that. <clears throat> it's, a it's a policy decision that needs to be made by the central bank. But the paper is nonetheless important because I think it acts as a transition between his old Tobin views and what's to come um, later. But then, you know, the 1972 paper is interesting, but then comes his 1973 book, another textbook that he writes. Um, and this is very confusing book. Um, I think it's a, it's a step backwards. Uh, King describes it as very largely an orthodox Keynesian uh, text. And I completely uh, agree. Here, Basil talks about clearly of the exogenous money supply. He draws it as vertical. He talks of um, bank, central banks controlling uh, reserves that influence uh, bank lending. Banks are uh, uh, financial uh, intermediaries. Um, he talks about uh, you know the reserve ratio, all of those conventional ideas. And um, so uh, how can we explain this, this step backwards? Um, well, simply, I think uh, the book was written by Basil's account in 1969. So before his Cambridge sabbatical. And I think that the book was too much into production to bring in any sort of substantive changes. Um, so the book went out, got published as is. Um, I think that's the end of the story. Uh, I don't think we should see it as much as a step backward, but simply as, you know, uh, it would have required too much. It was either about killing the project or letting it go forward. And I think changes were not very feasible. So I think that explains the book. Now, during this period uh, in 1974, paper, uh, Basil writes a paper, a couple of papers actually, on Pazinetti. So he's definitely exploring, expanding his interest on heterodox, in heterodox economics. He's reading Kieletsky. Um, So you can see the evolution uh, happening. Uh, papers on 74, 75. So quite the progression. Uh, in Basil's view. And then comes in 1977, uh, it's, uh, I'm going to end in about five minutes. Um, in 1978, uh, he has a uh, another sabbatical at the Bank of England. And he becomes very good friends with Charles Goodart. 
uh, that he describes as my favorite real world central banker for his encouragement of my fumbling early attempts to develop the notion of monetary endogeneity. So Basil recognizes this long struggle of, of escape, which he describes as fumbling early attempts. Um, and of course, ironically, Charles uh, ended up writing a paper called Has More Become Too Horizontal? Uh, I don't think there is such a thing as too horizontal, by the way. Um, so these early fumbling attempts, uh, I think, are um, his, you know, 1972-73 views. But um, he claims to have, fair, to have clearly come around to the view of uh, endogenous money after the central bank period. Um, and this corresponds to 1978, a paper in Challenge that I uh, talked about on monetary factors, which was reprinted in Eichner's book. Um, so I think, yes, I think here, what is interesting is that all these elements that were before uh, in his work, the importance of banks, the credit led uh, 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 demand for, for credit, um, uh, the credit worthiness, all of these elements are still here, but except what he gets rid of is the supply constraint. And uh, here finally he sees assets running to liabilities. Uh, he rejects the money multiplier model and all of the orthodox um, notions of reserves and et cetera. And uh, here central banks no longer chooses about letting money in, uh, being endogenous or not. Here, he, um, the supportive responsibilities of the central bank are much more important than controlling the money supply. Central banks must ensure the stability. And this is why they must be accommodative. And so, I mean, in a way, it's sort of a, you know, um, not exactly a, a circulationist view of endogenous money, but but it, it's it's clearly an evolutionary view. But these are the views that would uh, stay with him now from moving forward with his papers and his debates in the eighties about uh, the you know the, the, the that he had with people like uh, Tom Pally and um, Bob Pollin where both of them argued in terms of bicausal relationships when it comes to reserves. Uh, Basel was clear that reserves didn't play a role, that central banks had no choice but to uh, be accommodative. So um, in conclusion, and I was given 30 minutes and here I am, in conclusion, um, Basel the horizontalist um, didn't happen overnight. It was a very long uh, span of almost uh, 30 years or so, or 20 or to 30 years. Um, and uh, it was the result of a historical accident, so to speak, for which we've all gained from. But um, Basil's uh, presence in Cambridge at the time where Paul was there, and in an office that was between Jones and Paul's, all sort of uh, led to Basil being exposed to post Keynesian ideas. I don't think he might have been otherwise. And uh, I think history is funny that way. And so uh, from there on, uh, Basil became the post Keynesian that uh, we all know. Thank you very much. I'm not sure what's happening next. Since this, uh, most people are watching through YouTube, I'm not sure if people can ask questions. Uh, dear Professor, thank you very much for your presentation. Yes. 
Uh, now we are looking for any question by YouTube channel. If there is a question, I will ask you. Please wait. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. So uh, there is no question from YouTube channel. I'm looking again. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is no question by YouTube channel. Okay, no problem. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is a great conference. Um, I would have spoken a little bit longer, but uh, I was full 30 minutes, so that's fine. Um, uh, I encourage you all to pick up the copy of uh, Egyp to read the various papers um, in that. There's a paper by John Smithen, which is very, very good. Uh, he talks about, uh, so, you know, John is very happy that I named an interest rate rule in his honor. Uh, so he talks all about the Smithen rule and... Uh, as so uh, an income distribution, the link between monetary policy and income distribution, which I think is key in a theory of endogenous money. And um, so there's some great papers in there as well. Thank you very much, Professor, and hope to see you in Turkey. Yes, Thanks. I hope so too. When we yes. can start traveling again, we'll see. Yes. yes Thank so. you. I look forward to, to, to going there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.